Hey, good morning. Welcome to KubeCon and CloudNativeCon and to this Dapper Maintainers talk. Um, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Mark Fussell. I'm a Dapper Maintainer, and I'm also the CEO of Diagrid. And I'm Chris Gillum, a software architect at Microsoft, so we're focusing on serverless cloud platforms. And so today, we kind of want to dive into a little bit about what Dapper is, just get a little bit of the background. Um, we're going to spend quite a lot of time, and Chris is particularly on workflows, which is probably one of the most exciting things that we've been building into Dapper in the last few releases. Um, and then I'll kind of follow up with a little bit about talking about some of the things in the latest release, particularly around the outbox pattern. And then we're going to finish up with sort of the road ahead and where the actual project is going and sort of dive into sort of looking beyond the future. You know, what is Dapper? Um, Dapper is effectively a set of APIs that allow developers to build distributed applications, build cloud native applications. You know, it brings productivity for you to build across distributed platforms like Kubernetes. In essence, Dapper is a set of APIs that codify best practice patterns that save you time building things like request reply or pub sub event messaging or long running stateful or workflow applications. And by combining these together and coming at it from any language or any run, run time of your favorite, you can build applications that run on a set of VMs across Kubernetes. It's not bound to Kubernetes platform, but you know, it's about productivity for developers. So when you're building applications, Dapper APIs allow you to you know, distinctly build them more productively, fast, and then half the time you'd expect. In fact, we did a great um, state of Dapper survey a few months back, and it showed that you know, Dapper itself saves developers 30% of the time getting their applications into um, production. Now, um, you know, another way to think about this is that you know, Dapper is a set of patterns um, that you can use from each one of your runtimes. So you can take a, 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 you know, one of your favorite languages, you can take your favorite framework inside of it all, and you can think of them as patterns that you see typically codified, like Saga workflows, or request reply, or long-running event-driven applications. And you know, Dapper alone you know, is very powerful, but you can be used alongside other you know, a, um, APIs and frameworks that you use. It doesn't have to be you know, solely used and embraced. It's kind of it's a combination of effect that you can bring together with other frameworks. So when you look at this as well, you, know, you can look at it through the eyes well of you know, using microservices.io as a place to show microservices patterns. You know, we kind of layered the common use patterns on top of that. And so you can see that you know, even from a microservices sense, you can bring these consistent patterns to your development. Now, you know, that is it from a developer perspective. But what does it look like from a platform perspective? One of the key questions as well that we kind of need to answer ourselves is, you know, how is it that Dapper fits in with uh, hosting platforms that you use? So when you look at three very common hosting platforms, you get the less opinionated Kubernetes pl platforms, very powerful, but you, know, you have to think about a lot how to deploy and run to them. And then you get the very opinionated functions platforms. And to some degree, you know, Dapper sort of embraces all those different levels. But one of the common questions is, you know, what's missing from the conversation about how is it that you know, developers using those platforms talk to the underlying infrastructure? And what we see commonly is that you know, developers bring in a particular SDK and they bind tightly to particular infrastructure libraries and sort of tightly couple those two. So one of the key attributes that Adapa does is it allows you to have a separation of those concerns. It allows you to have your underlying infrastructure through the API contracts and also through the idea of a component model so you can swap out the underlying infrastructure yet make your code consistent. So this is very relevant to an audience here where you're thinking about platforms and how they have co uh, contracts that fit with the application world in terms of the application developers building on top of them. So in a particular case, a very powerful with Dapper is you can build applications locally and you can also then move them to the cloud and all you have to do is swap out this underlying component model. Or you may have built an application that's even outside the cloud, but be able to say, there I'm using you know, particular underlying technologies that I want to do from message broker or state store. And without changing my code, I can move them into a cloud and swap out the state store I was using for a cloud store or a cloud message broker. So this all gets surfaced effectively in what in Dapper is called the component model. You know, for each one of the, behind each one of the APIs is a component model. So for example, behind the state API, there's a component model for state stores about how you store state in a key value store. Or behind the message broker, the publishing API, there's a, a, an API to plug in different message brokers. And this portability of code prevents you from having lock-in. It provides flexibility. And you know, time and time again, we have conversations with organizations that go, I wish I hadn't tightly coupled my code together. 
Now, Dapper does layer a lot of functionalities on top of this. It's not just purely an integration play. So, for example, in the state management place, where you have non-transactional state stores, Dapper provides transactional semantics for multi-rights across it all. Or Dapper provides security at the topic level for security messaging that's layered on top of all those message brokers. So it's very powerful runtime in its own right, providing a lot of features around patterns that layer on top of this component model. But this combination of component models and patterns giving you portability and flexibility you know, translates effectively into you know, how is it you build a distributed application. Well, here I might have an application that uses PubSub to coordinate through a Redis state store that sends messages to another service that's sending messages out to Twilio. And then it may do a direct invoke message um, to another service here that saves some state or talks to another cloud service. And when you look at the design of this application, binding them all together effectively is a set of dapper APIs. And those APIs make it consistent. It allows you to have a contract that you talk about how you build your applications and the flexibility and portability of that is incredibly important. In fact, the more we spend time with customers, the more we see that this contract of having an API that keeps the portability of your code um, and all the rich features that Dapper has so that you can build applications quickly becomes very important to them. But what's also critical is across all of these APIs is you get consistent observability, security, and reliability. So if my calls fail to service invocation, they can retry, or my PubSub does retry. I do end-to-end -end security across all of this. So you get security out of the box, you get observability out of the box, you get reliability out of the box. And by the time you put all of this together and you think about this, what really Dapper is, it's an integrated set of APIs that all work very well together and provide this seamless connectivity to pretty much give you 80% of your whole app you want. And with the introduction of workflow, which is in so many applications today, we have a business logic that has to run, that communicates with other systems, that sends pub some messages, that does service invocation calls, that talks to external systems. You can find that you, know, you have a very powerful suite of APIs that runs on many different platforms, that communicates with, um, that runs on many different cloud um, services you can hook up to, and you, know, you can see your productivity about building these applications. So with that, I am going to switch over and let Chris dive into workflow and all the amazing things that have been happening there. All right, thanks a lot, Mark. So I thought we'd start out by talking about what is a workflow? And I think this is an important question because uh, depending on who you ask, you might get a very different answer. So we'll start out with the definition that we used in the Dapper Workflow project, which is a sequence of software-defined tasks or activities that are performed to accomplish a specific goal or objective. So obviously that's a little generic, but, but sort of gives you an idea of how we see what workflows are. Diving in a little bit deeper, uh, let's talk about some of the ideal characteristics that we think workflows should have. Uh, one is that they're stateful and durable, right? Uh, we want them to be able to execute to completion regardless of infrastructure failures. Another is that they can be either short-lived or they could be long-running, right? Uh, the workflow might run in just a few seconds or it might take weeks to complete maybe never ends at all. Uh, we believe that workflows should be virtual, meaning that if you are running a workflow in one VM uh, and we need to load balance that thing, we should be able to do that, to unload it from memory, reload it to another node uh, transparently without sort of impacting uh, the availability of that workflow. Also addressable, workflows uh, should have some sort of an ID uh, such that we can send messages to that workflow uh, to help it move along if it needs to as well as clear lifecycle semantics, right? So these aren't just state machines. These actually have lifecycle semantics such as uh, pending, running, suspended, uh, completed, failed, terminated. You get the idea. So given that, we came up with a set of features that we wanted to uh, surface in Dapper Workflow. Here's some of the main ones, one being activities, right? These are the basic units of work that uh, workflows are responsible for scheduling. They have at least once execution guarantees, and they do sort of the core processing or uh, you know, making outbound network calls, those sorts of things that workflows often do. Uh, durable timers, the ability to schedule arbitrarily long delays in workflow execution. Again, this could be a few seconds. This could be a uh, you know, month-long delay. Uh, the workflow shouldn't care. Uh, child workflows, so the ability to sort of break down a larger workflow into smaller, uh, easy to understand subflows. Uh, this idea of external events, right? Workflows should be able to interact with the external world around it, not just be completely isolated to its own uh, set of activities. 
Uh, so for example, being able to take in an input, uh, if there's like a human in the loop uh, process that needs to be automated. Um, and then uh, lastly, retry policies. So you know, if you have an activity that does some work and then it fails, uh, just the ability to be able to retry that using either a static uh, sort of declarative retry policy or even a code-based retry policy. And we'll jump into the code piece in a little bit here. Um, so with Dapper Workflow, you are actually writing workflows in code. And this is an important distinction that we have in Dapper Workflow versus many other traditional workflow engines. Uh, today, we support uh, .NET, Python, and Java, uh, with Go and uh, Node.js support coming very soon. Um, but the important thing to, to note here is that the code that you see, and I apologize if it's a little bit small, but this is ordinary code just implemented as a simple function, right? This is not something like uh, Airflow, where you might be using code to construct a DAG. Uh, rather, we're just using idiomatic code in the language of your choice to actually define the workflow execution. In fact, you can even attach debuggers to this while the workflow is running uh, to actually step through and see what's happening. And this allows you to use uh, conditionals, loops, local variables, uh, try catch sort of exception handling, all with the guarantees that I sort of mentioned earlier about uh, being able to run sort of reliably and durably being able to move it from one VM to the other, uh, so on and so forth. So if you've ever uh, heard of, say, temporal workflow or cadence workflow or even Azure durable functions, it's effectively the same idea that we've sort of taken and put into the Dapper project uh, to make available in a cloud agnostic way. Uh, so the way that this basically works behind the scenes is there are two pieces. There is the Dapper workflow engine, which runs in the Dapper sidecar. And then there is your workflow code, which runs within your application container. Now, the workflow engine, what it does is it takes care of all of the state management. It takes care of the sort of failure handling, retry, and basically all the scheduling of actions uh, for you. Whereas the code that you write is purely focused on you know, what is the business logic that I'm trying to implement, right? What are my tasks? What order do they need to run in? Um, those sorts of things. In fact, if you dive in a little bit uh, more closely to sort of see this protocol, there's actually this uh, two-way sort of gRPC streaming protocol that we use between uh, the Dapper sidecar and your workflow application, where the sidecar basically tells you, all right, uh, please start running workflow X, or please start running uh, activity Y, and then, uh, your code goes ahead and it runs that particular function, uh, or at least that step of the function, and then uh, it'll send back a result to the sidecar, and then the sidecar then and goes and saves it into the state store. Basically uh, creating sort of an execution log so that if there is a failure, we know exactly how to rebuild that workflow and get it back into the state that it was in before. Uh, so with that, I would love to jump into an actual demo. Um, this is an order processing demo, but I do want to highlight that uh, Dapper Workflow, uh, in addition to being able to do things like business workflows, is also very good for other scenarios, such as uh, infrastructure provisioning, a massively uh, scalable uh, sort of batch processing type jobs, um, and, and just a variety of other workflow scenarios, but we'll focus on sort of this more business order processing one for now. Uh, we have five microservices in this process. We're using the Dapper State Store, we're using PubSub, as well as the Dapper Service Invocation Building Block, which allows the workflow basically to communicate to all these different services, either directly using Service Invocation or indirectly sort of using PubSub uh, via Redis. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over now to Visual Studio Code, where I have an app. Hopefully this is visible enough. Um, I can zoom in just a little bit here. But over on the left-hand side, you can see I've got uh, four services, inventory, notifications, order processing, payments, and shipping. I also have a dapper.yaml file, which you could sort of think of as uh, you know, uh, the definition of our app for running it locally. Now, normally in production, you'd run this in Kubernetes, uh, but Dapper has a lot of great tooling that allows you to also run your apps locally on the machine. Uh, the main app that we're going to focus on is the order processing app. Now, this is all written in Python. And if we dive into this, this is the app that's going to define our actual workflow logic. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this. So we have a bunch of business classes, uh, which we have here, which are totally custom. And then we have a set of functions. We have a process order workflow, which is our workflow function. 
and we have a bunch of activities, which are the pieces of code that the workflow is basically going to orchestrate in a reliable way. Now, the workflow uh, takes in two arguments. There is a workflow context, and then there is some input, which is some uh, business entity that you define within your app, in this case, an order. And if we look into this function a little bit, one interesting thing that you will notice is that, uh, especially if you're a Python developer, you'll realize that this is um, a generator function. And so what we're doing is we're taking this context object, which is given to you when you schedule this workflow. Uh, we're able to use it to do various actions, like calling an activity, which is going to do some work. Um, in this case, you pass in what is a, a pointer to the function that executes that activity. And the result of this call is going to be a task. And if you yield this task, uh, like we do here in this generator function, what's going to happen is we're going to basically tell the Dapper runtime, which is running in that sidecar, hey, please execute this task that I wanted to execute. In this case, the notify one. Now, if we take a look at the notify task, it's, it's rather simple. It just takes the Dapper client and invokes the uh, publish event API to uh, publish the message to a pub sub broker. In this case, it's just a Redis pub sub broker. Um, but that's effectively what it's going to do. Now, this notify activity, it might run on the local machine. It might run on a completely different machine, basically depending on the load balancing characteristics uh, that we need at the time. Uh, but the idea is that this workflow can schedule these activities as it makes progress. Another thing that I'll mention too, when we do this yield, it's going to pause the workflow, wait for this activity that it calls to complete, and once it completes, the generator uh, moves to the next step, uh, which is, you know, in this case, calling another activity, uh, you know, like reserve inventory, right? That's sort of the next step that we do in this workflow. Um, when you call these activities, and you yield them, you can also get the output of the activity. So for example, when we reserve inventory, we get some output back uh, saying, was it successful? Uh, we can write some if conditionals to say, hey, was, you know, was it successful? Uh, if not, you know, send a notification that it failed. Uh, we can exit the workflow at any time to complete it using a return statement. Again, just using idiomatic code that, that you're used to, uh, to author all the steps within the workflow. And again, each time we do a step, we do this yield, which tells the sidecar, hey, please go uh, execute that work that I asked you to. Um, and at which point, we also save our state uh, so that if there were to be some sort of an infrastructure failure, we're able to still resume this workflow, load it back into memory, and resume from the last yield point that we had. Uh, so just quickly to um, walk through the last steps, we'll get to this part in a minute, uh, but we sort of submit the payment uh, after we've reserved the inventory. And then uh, we submit the order to shipping as one of the last steps here. Uh, but you'll notice too that we, have, we wrap this in a try accept because if that uh, shipping uh, operation, if it fails for some reason, well, we've already submitted the payment, right? So we need to compensate for that, which is why inside of this accept block, uh, we have another activity where we can call refund payment to make sure that if for some reason that we're not able to complete the shipping, uh, we're going to refund whatever that payment was. And so this is uh, an important sort of guarantee that we offer that we're going to run through your workflow code, um, the presence of failures. And so if there is some sort of application level issue that prevents shipping, you know, we can have compensation for that, which is often a very important feature. Um, and then once that's all done, we do a final notification to say that we're done. And then uh, just to quickly, oh, and one other thing that I think is, is pretty interesting too. So I've showed you so far just uh, orchestrating a bunch of steps. Let's say we want to add a, a human approval in the loop as well. Let's say that if an order is over $1,000, uh, that somebody needs to manually approve this thing. Uh, well, Workflow has tools for that too. So one of the operations, that, one of the tasks that you can schedule in a workflow is waiting for an external event. Uh, you define what that external event is. In this case, uh, we're calling it approval. Um, and let's, so we're going to pause the workflow and say, we're not going to continue until somebody approves this. We receive the approval event. But at the same time, we also don't want to wait forever for somebody to approve this. Let's say we want to bound it to like 24 hours. So we have another task, which is a create timer task. You can set any duration to this, uh, in this case, 24 hours. 
And uh, we're not, and basically we're gonna wrap those two tasks within the, using this when any API to say, um, when either the approval task or the timeout expiration task complete, uh, go ahead and resume the workflow and return back whichever of those tasks was the winner. So uh, below that, we can say if the winner was the timeout expiration, then you know, we can notify that, hey, we, we failed to receive an approval for this, and we go ahead and complete uh, the workflow as a canceled order effectively. Um, otherwise, you know, check to make sure that we got the approval that we expect and then continue running uh, the workflow. So anyways, that's, that's sort of an interesting uh, uh, feature that we also have as part of workflows. There's a few more, but we'll focus just on that for now. And then lastly, I just want to show really quick, uh, we have a few APIs. This is just a Flask, a Flask app as well, uh, where we allow you to take Adapt Workflow Client. You can schedule new workflows, uh, say which one you want to schedule, give it an input. You can give it an instance ID so that you can reference it later, uh, which we're going to do. So enough talking, uh, let's actually run this. So I'm going to do uh, Dapper Run. And what that's going to do is it's going to take all these uh, five microservice processes uh, that I've defined within my app, and it's going to start them up on my local machine. And uh, what I'm also going to do while that's uh, starting up is I'm going to open up on the bottom half here, we have our notification service, which is the subscriber to all of those PubSub notifications that the workflow is going to be publishing. Um, so anyways, we see down here that it says connection open. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start a workflow. So hopefully I can do this in a way that's somewhat readable. I'm going to go to the top here. And let's go ahead and uh, submit an order. Uh, this is going to be a slightly expensive order. Gosh, sometimes this gets a little funny. OK, there we go. So we're going to submit this order. And the order was received, and immediately you can start seeing that the, the other service, which is subscribing to the notifications, is now uh, getting those notifications that we received the order, uh, we served the inventory, uh, we're waiting for the approval because it exceeded our threshold. So that means we need to do the manual approval. Now, one thing that I also want to show you here, which I'll go ahead and maximize this uh, for that. Let's see, how do I get back my... Uh, here, sorry. Okay, another thing I want to show you is uh, recover from infrastructure failures. So I'm going to actually control C this, and now I have just shut down all of my processes in my microservice, sort of simulating like a data, data center outage or something like that. So we can see in our UI that the connection is closed, we've lost connectivity, everything is down. Um, at some point, though, uh, you know, our ops team will come in, they're going to get it all back and running again. Uh, but, you know, what happened to our workflow, right? It was in the middle of running, waiting for approval. You know, will it be okay? And so the uh, connection is open, uh, so we know that, uh, you know, our systems are up and running again. What I'm going to go ahead and do now is try to send a request that is going to complete that approval process. So I'm going to go ahead and send that. Uh, we received it, and what we should see, which we do, is that uh, the order was indeed approved, uh, the payment was processed successfully, um, and it looks like there was an error submitting to the shipping. I think that's because maybe I, I did it a little bit too fast. Um, but anyways, the, the important takeaway here is that the workflow was able to continue where it left off uh, without uh, sort of needing to redo any of the previous steps, which we can sort of see by checking on this notification service here. So that's an, a very important capability of, of the service. Last thing that I want to show you uh, really quickly, if I can find my mouse pointer, is uh, we have distributed tracing uh, that we support with workflows as well. So if you need to go and sort of debug and see what happened, uh, you can do that. Uh, we have um, a nice display here in Zipkin which shows you, uh, first of all, the full span of the workflow itself, how long did it took, uh, in this case, 79 seconds. And you can actually see of all those activities that it scheduled, when did they run, how long did they run for, sort of what was their status, uh, so on and so forth. And even you can sort of dig in and see uh, you know, some other details like, okay, it, it failed uh, doing the shipping step. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, so sort of that end-to-end -end distributed tracing transparency that you would hope to get with a workflow system that's calling services, uh, you know, a, a whole set of different microservices. Uh, so anyways, that's what I wanted to show. 
Uh, Mark, I think I'll hand it back to you. Well, it's pretty incredible stuff, workflow is. <laughs> We're going to switch laptops here in just a moment. All so right. we're just going to jump over here. OK. I'll let you take your phone. Is it the other side? Oh, it's the other side. And hopefully it should spring to life. There we go. So yeah, that's Workflow. Workflow, I mean, you can see how powerful it is, especially combined with the other Dapper APIs. Um, let's dive in a little bit more here because I think another incredible capability we added into Dapper Runtime is another pattern. If you think of Workflows around Saga, we put also the Outbox pattern. You know, what is the Outbox pattern? The Outbox pattern is a combination of doing a transaction around a state save and also a message send. So for example, say you are saving in orders uh, or account information and then you want to tell another service to send an email. You don't want to send an email saying your account has been created and then not save it and you don't want to save it and not tell a person that their email wasn't sent. So you'd like those to be bound together under a single transaction. That's exactly what the outbox pattern does. So for example, in this case I can save my order into the database or my account information and then send a pub sub message that's sent to another emailing service and that tells you know, my customer, whoever it is, that I have now created your account and it's ready to go. And you want them to be consistent. It turns out it's pretty hard to do in an easy way. So we're going to show how you know, on any one of the 15 or 20 state stores that we have inside a Dapper Runtime, you can simply combine any one of the pubs or brokers with any one of the state stores to do, it, uh, to do the outbox pattern between them all. And I'm going to do it between um, Redis PubSub for my message broker, and I'm going to do it for MySQL, both running on my local machine, to show you how you can put these two together. Let me just switch over here into VS Studio, so VS Code. So let me maximize this. Okay, so I've got two um, uh, services here. One, one's an order processor service, which simply creates new orders inside. Um, and it's going to save them into a, a, a SQL store locally. And all it does is it does uses a Dapper client inside here to execute a state transaction into my uh, local SQL store. And it just saves a number of orders. In fact, I just do two orders inside this. And then I have a, a, a order notification service. All it's doing is it's listening on the PubSub broker to orders. Um, and it just publishes and I receive a notification from my PubSub uh, broker. In this particular case, my state store I'm saving into, if I return here, you'll see I'm saving into my Dapper store name here, which is my SQL store. And you know, these component model, as we talked about at the beginning of this talk, is defined here as a SQL state store. And I kind of have my connection string, how to talk to it all. But in order to take advantage of the outbox pattern, I simply have to add two metadata properties into my component manifest. I simply have to say the order topic that I want to send on through my pubs or broker. And I want to say the name of my pubs or broker that I'm going to send it to. So that means any time I save a state into this state store, and at the same time, I want to send out a message through my broker, that combination will happen through the outbox pattern. So that's all you have to do. And you just simply have to add these two here to any one of the 20 different types of state stores that we have um, and be able to take advantage of inside you know, your, dapper run, your, your dapper project. So let me uh, put this together. I too also have taken advantage of using a dapper run command. I'm going to show you first though, if I look into my state store, I don't have anything saved inside this. So this is looking at my local MySQL state store. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply run um, and I've got the dapper run command inside here, again, combined into um, two um, microservices that are run together. So if I run this, you'll see that it'll run the order processor. It'll create an order here. It'll save it into my local state, state store. And then you'll see that um, no, the notifications get sent. Um, and actually, let me just check here that I put this into the right SQL state store. And then the notifications will get received inside my pub sub broker, which I don't think to have got run in this particular case. So let me try it one more time inside here. So these are the notes we've received. OK, and then you see that when I 
run this, you'll see the order notification received through my PubSub broker, combining the, the two with my save. So it's an incredible, incredible feature that you can simply do this on any one of the brokers. Um, and if you go back to my state store inside here, you'll see now if I run the query inside here, here's my two orders that were created and saved. Um, and if I go and look in my Redis, um, if I actually look into my Redis one, which I don't have a viewer inside here, you'll see that the message will get sent through my Redis broker. So incredibly powerful. And these are the sorts of things that we're doing inside the Dapper project. You know, we're continually innovating to make sure that we bring very consumable, easy to use patterns to developers so that you can spend your time you know, building great business code and not having to implement common patterns like this that you should find and make them available for wherever you come from today, you know, whatever language, whatever framework that you're deciding to choose. So where's Dapper going and where's the roadmap of where we're looking for? Well, we release Dapper every four months, every three months. We release it four times a year, every quarter. We just did the 112 release um, about a month ago that contained things like the Outbox pattern. And then we have the 13 and the 14 release that will be coming you know, middle, early next year and sometime you know, in spring of the year after that. And there we're focusing a lot on getting things stable around workflow and a pub sub, bulk pub sub, which is in our pub sub broker APIs. We're looking at how we're going to introduce a distributed schedule API. Think of how, how do I run cron jobs on a regular basis? So I want this thing to happen every day or every hour. Um, turns out to be incredibly useful to be able to have an API that schedules things on a regular basis. An amazing feature is coming is the hot reloading of components. Today, when you change a, a component, you have to restart your Dapper sidecar to pick up any of those definitions. We're having it so that if you change a component manifest, and it'll automatically get road, reloaded for you without your Dapper sidecar starting up, which is in itself <laughs> is uh, a huge feature, which has been long asked for. Uh, so now you, know, you can keep your systems running and without and deploy new um, components inside more. Um, Another deployment model is you can run Dapper as a sidecar today that runs on the Kubernetes world per pod, but there are also circumstances where you want to run it on a per deployment side. That means any number of instances of a particular application can have a single deployment for a, a Dapper runtime for them. So that just allows a different deployment models, which is often asked for, especially when there are some restrictions in your testing environment or maybe some of your deployment environments. And then finally, you know, we do a lot to make sure that SDKs have consistency between them and also having the idea that you can have Dapper running remotely that you can attach to over, the, um, over from, your local SD, from your SDK. So those are some of the immediate things. There's many, many more other features coming in sort of those releases. But as we look beyond that, you know, there's a lot of APIs that we still take to, through to stabilization that we introduced over the last year around distributed lock and crypto APIs. We're heavily into security. Um, We've done amazing work today to give application identity through Spiffy to each one of the applications, but we want to take and do more there in terms of deeper Spiffy integration and also integration with cert manager so you can bring in external search from uh, external search, search authorities. Um, we are always looking at improving the local developer experience. You saw us for multi-app run today that allows you to run multiple services on your same machine. How do we do things like local component validation and more types of local components? And then generally inside the project, we're very fanatical about because we do multi-deployment across multi-clouds and testing on multiple environments, uh, we focus a lot on testing not only of the deployment models, but also perf, end-to-end -end testing, and making sure that you know, we really have a stable, resilient system around them all. And then I think one of the most exciting areas we've had a lot of asks for is state storage and how you improve the types of patterns that it has. You see today that we have key value store as a type of state storage, but as we look towards other things that we can bring inside there, document store type, blob storage, and even SQL storage as general purpose APIs so that you can you know, have that abstraction layer over all types of types of storage, not just sort of key value storage. So now you can have that component model over blob storage of different clouds, for example. That I think is something that will really open up the different types of distributed or stateful applications you're gonna build. And then beyond that, um, you know, we are fanatical about getting Dapper integrated with other things inside the ecosystem. So we've worked really, really, really hard with other projects. And if you are a contributor or a maintainer of another project that you think has a synergy with Dapper, we'd love to hear from you. For example, we've done a lot with test containers and vCluster and Open Function and Kratix. Um, and in progress, 
As I mentioned, more integration with Spiffy and Cert Manager, but bringing K-native functions together with Dapper is an initiative we're working on. And generally, a lot of people have come to us and said, you know, Dapper APIs are becoming so um, unique, so specific and so well adopted, we'd love to see sort of the general open API specification around it all so that you may even have other implementations of them. So please come and talk to us about you know, how we can engage with you inside the other ecosystems, how we can get Dapper integrated as part of all of this. You know, I'll leave you with the fact that Dapper is about making developers happy, you know, making you enjoy what you do, not focus on the plumbing. Don't reinvent the pattern. The pattern's been done for you. Build your applications. Use the patterns that Dapper gives for you. And you know, we'd love for you to come and join our 3,000 contributors, our 7,000 Discord community. You can find a ton of other information inside here in terms of how to get started, how to contribute. We have community calls twice a month that we often look for having demos and deep engagement with the community. And I'll just leave you with, go off to our repo, where if you want to get a community-supported digital badge to show your excitement about the project, scan this, put it inside your GitHub repo, it kind of shows how you support the project. So with that, thank you very much today.